welcome everybody. Um, I think we'll get started. Um, we have a great panel for you today. Um, as you know, uh, we have uh, Renee Tajima-Pena, Vincent Pham, Grace Lee, Brian Hugh, Ba Wynn, and Melissa Prukashat all here today to share their perceptions, wisdom, annoyances, and hopes. And um, before we begin, we're going to see just um, a short clip to get us in the mood for what's about to happen. At the top of last year At the funeral drowning Cause I couldn't hold back tears But after all that's happened this past year Part of me sees grace in the fact That she's not here As a grandson this statement's a fact No elderly should ever be victim Of such a heinous attack Pray on the weak Only cowards would take advantage of that No more staying meek It's time to take a stand and react A simple trip to the market Thought the streets were safe Turns targets I speak up for my people's sake From this pandemic I'm hopeful that we'll see escape Until then love's the only vaccine for hate now when my folks leave the house, it's quite the norm My mind's flooded with thoughts of what might go wrong Truthfully, I wish I didn't have to write this song But it's only right I recite it since this mic is on If you black and white, says the man in the mirror The squad's facing the terror I'm talking mother, father, sister, brother, grandma and grandpapa All doomed cause of skin color Paranoid like my mind playing tricks on this ghetto boy So I gotta scream for my mama like I'm George Floyd Now I'm all in linen like John imagine it. But he ain't give peace a chance, he took eight lives with him Where the love goes still unanswered Politicians, they be flipping Gabby Douglas If I so they could conquer, then they chain our ancestors Come together like the Beatles remastered Wow, thanks so much for that, Bao. That's half of the piece. Um, and uh, I think it, it hits a lot of the points we're going to be addressing. Um, the, let me just, for those of you who haven't been part of these before, this is the Film Quarterly webinar. We've been trying to do them about once a month now this year, um, till everyone has so much Zoom fatigue we have to give up. And um, we run it in this way. The first we're going to hear from each of the panelists for about five minutes. Uh, their thoughts on this current moment. Then we're going to open it to the panel at large for them to respond to each other and further that conversation. And then the last half hour we're reserving to take up um, your questions and comments from the Q&A or the chat. So um, welcome to Reconsidering AAPI Documentary at a Time of Anti-AAPI Violence. And uh, we've been thinking about what this moment means with these attacks now on critical race theory, um, inhabiting this uh, post-George Floyd moment of racial reckoning, um, the post-Minari and Chloe Zhao Academy moment, and at the same time this escalation of anti-AAPI violence throughout the country. So it was uh, welcome news yesterday when I saw on the BBC feed that Illinois has just become the first state to mandate teaching Asian American history in the schools. Um, thanks to the uh, Democratic governor of Illinois. And it goes into effect next fall, fall 2022, when they've had time to um, develop uh, curriculum materials. So that was at least a good note to begin on. Um, and to remind everybody, we are recording this session and it will be posted in a few days uh, to live permanently on the Film Quarterly website, where you can find all the webinars that we've done. Uh, and use them either to show your friends, um, to show your parents or children, uh, or to use in teaching. It's, it's all there freely available. So with that, we're going to move on. 
and begin um, the formal part of our program. And I'm really thrilled to be welcoming um, my old friend Renee Tajima Pena uh, back here, um, a filmmaker who most of you know from the early, early work on Who Killed Vincent Chin, many films since then, and most recently the Asian American series on public television and the May 19th project uh, that she spearheaded this spring. You can see the full bios for everybody in the chat so we don't take up too much time. Renee, over to you. Thanks so much, Ruby, and thank you, Film Quarterly. It's really the only journal that's taken the Asian American film seriously, Asian American film criticism seriously, and I know, Ruby, you've been doing this work for about 40 years that I've known you. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, we're, we're really at an inflection point right now, and um, we're all talking about narrative shift. And just to give context, I think, you know, narrative shift can be as simple as just make us visible or don't be racist. But right now, things are far more urgent and calls for far more um, aggressive responses on the part of Asian American documentary filmmakers. It's, you know, my, my mom is 94 years old in, in January, and she grew up during the Great Depression and, you know, was incarcerated for three years in a concentration camp during World War II, a camp for Japanese Americans. And she looked at me and she said, I have never seen it so bad. I mean, th there, there's a real shit show out there in terms of freedom of expression, in terms of the very kind of fundamental structures of the democracy. I mean, so as, as uh, content creators, as storytellers, we're not only dealing with, let's put Asian stories on, on screen, we're dealing with outright lies. Um, we're dealing with attacks on documented truths, legislation that silences our history. There was that victory in Illinois, yes, but in many other states, um, our history, you know, under the guise of critical race theory um, is being silenced. And, um, you know, like my mom, in my four years of, of making films, I feel the same way. Things have never been so, so bad. Um, so Asian Americans ourselves also are really, once again, right smack in the middle of this epic battle over the narrative that has very serious implications. I mean, we've seen particularly the, the way the model minority myth has been used as a wedge against African Americans and other people of color, like in the 1950s and 60s, where the, the model minority image was really weaponized uh, during the civil rights movement. You know, Asian Americans being positioned as these bootstrap strivers who didn't complain, who didn't protest. Um, and, you know, we were used as this wedge against legitimate demands for equality um, by the Black liberation movement. And you, today you can see that happening in many ways. I mean, in the past, uh, just this year in 2021, we've seen this deployment on social media and in the press of these viral videos and these viral videos of black and brown assailants attacking Asian Americans, attacking Asian American elderly. Um, and so there's this collision in those videos of these two stereotypes, the stereotype of black brown criminality, meaning the stereotype of the Asian American model minority victim. Um, and this despite the data, and there have been new studies from the University of Michigan and the University of Maryland that guess what? The anti-Asian hate is overwhelmingly the perpetrators are white and white males. Um, but you can see how this idea of black brown criminality, you know, the, the Asian victim is being used to counter calls for defunding the police, or even, even just as simple as police reform, and you know, getting more boots on the ground, and and um, the hate crimes legislation, you know, raising um, um, the the prison time, etc. The you know, contributing to the whole carceral kind of responses to to social ills. So th that's one reason Jeff Chang. Um, and I, with working alongside Bao and, and Grace, launched the May 19th project, which was a social media campaign to really counter um, these narratives and tell the story, the whole legacy uh, of AAPI solidarity with other communities of color 
And, and as a filmmaker, filmmakers, as content creators, we really made this formal choice of, you know, even though my whole thing is making long form documentaries, I thought, well, if I make, make a long form documentary, yeah, 2023, 2025, you know, who knows when it's going to be finished. We decided to stick with one, two and three minute um, social media web shorts that align with the urgency of what was happening um, in the Asian American community and in movements um, that were people were really thinking about and calling for solidarity. Bao's music videos is a really profound example of that, taking this, um, this issue of anti-Asian violence and really positioning it within like the lens of you know, solidarity between African Americans and, and Asian Americans. That's a great point to end on, Renee. Oh, okay. I want to hear you much more, and we're going to get a chance to. So, keep 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 that neck. Hold on to that next thought. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, um, I want to move on, and and we're going to hear from Vincent Pham, who's at Willamette University, speaking to us from there. We've tried to have a combination of filmmakers and academics here on the panel. Of course, Renee does it all, so she's both. But other than that, we've tried to pretty much have a split, and Vincent. You've been studying um, this question um, out of your perch at Willamette, and we really want to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to be uh, amongst such great scholars, filmmakers, and all around great people. I mean, I watch and read and listen to your work for intellectual richness, aesthetic beauty, and just joy, right? So it's really a, a treat to be here. Um, so I'm here as a communication and media scholar, so I'm attuned to how we talk about things, right? The processes of meaning making regarding culture, identity, and rhetoric. So in the prompt to reconsider a API documentary at a time of anti-API violence, violence, my mind goes towards what does AAPI mean, right? Whom does it signify and represent? And what are the stakes of this term at this specific historical moment of anti-API violence? And then, you know, that beckons the question is what is the role of AAPI documentary specifically beyond anything else? So many of us here, I think, are well familiar with the term Asian American, born out of the 1968 Third World Liberation Strikes to articulate the concerns of, a of people of Asian descent living in the United States, right? This is a shift from the, quote, oriental or ethnic slash national specific of articulations to one negotiating the tension of being both in and out of the U.S. Not a U.S. Uh, state of civic belonging. So in that sense, it's it, it's an Asian American racial project, right? One that sought to set the terms of establishing our presence and belonging in the places we live. So our historical understanding and idea of it is powerful, right? It's motivating, it's uniting, um, it, it brings people like us together. But I think about the current context of its usage within a neoliberal multicultural state, right? Asian American, and it's, as its pan-ethnic possibilities has morphed into AAPI, which has also morphed into what I've more recently heard of APIDA, so Asian Pacific Islander Desi American, all possibly under the guise of symbolic recognition and multicultural inclusion. So let's not also forget the conversations forwarded by PI uh, scholars such as Vicente Diaz that asked us to consider the role of PI within Asian American and Asian American studies. Yes, yeah, so this is all for the sake of inclusion. But inclusion into what, right? And this really makes me slightly concerned about the term Asian American and its protege, right? How are they primarily modes of categorization, devoid of history and activism, but mobilized by the state institutions and political parties, not for liberatory potential, but instead for the benefit of white supremacy, right? So Asian American, API, uh, APIDA becomes legible and then also then co-opted and managed how is it then used to dismantle affirmative action policies in colleges under the guise of merit? And how does it deflect our attention from anti-Blackness deployed to defend police officers under a notion of equality? So I, I always come back and I always end up thinking about um, Kent Ono's 1995 Amerasia piece about resigning, uh, resigning Asian America, right? The play upon the words resign as, to, as in to retire and let fade into history as it's no longer useful, um, but also on the re-sign as to re-signify, right? To quote, active practice of coming to terms with ever-changing social conditions, end quote, and reconfigure our discursive relations that have led us to want to retire or mobile or use this term in a very specific way. So here I, I, I here I think about 
and I see AAPI documentary at this specific moment as helping us reconfigure our relationship to the term and what it means. And what comes to mind to me is, you know, Renee's great work on the Asian American series and Ursel Liang's Down a Dark Stairwell at this specific moment. Um, they reconfigure not by telling us, but by also by showing us, providing modes and models of reimagination re of what is possibly lost or gained by doing so. And, you know, and I think about my family here on some levels, right? And, you know, we're probably in many in this position that while our family knows what we do and what I do, uh, academics and filmmakers kid us, like they don't also really know what we do, right? And our kind of wealth of knowledge. Um, so I think about my oldest sister watching the Asian American series on PBS with her mixed race kids talking about the messy history of Japanese concentration camps in relationship to our own history as Vietnamese refugees. And even though my sisters know that I do Asian American studies, like they also don't realize that this is something that I've also been thinking about for the past 15 years, right? Um, and now they they watch a documentary and things just click, click for them, right? And as I, and so this, this is a particular way of thinking about AAPI documentaries and audience um, and what it means to be Asian American now at this moment connected to these particular types of histories. And then as I watched uh, Ursa Liang's documentary, Down a Dark Stairwell, about the shooting and death of Akaya Gurley by police officer Peter Liang, I was drawn to the stories about Black and Asian American via Chinese American community, and the stories they told us themselves and us through protests. And I find myself asking, who actually wins? And how do we see winning when it comes to police and anti-Asian violence? And then what is the cost of Asian Americans winning or losing? And what some of these documentaries show us is that we don't win within a white supremacist world when we think we are or feel that we are, or that our stories now informed by developed scholarship and amplified with celebrity narrations can reach new AAPI audiences and even non-AAPI ones too. So I see AAPI documentary as part of an important role of re-signifying and reconfiguring of AAPI within anti-Asian violence, but also anti-Black and anti-Indigenous uh, movements, right? How do right. we understand those? Like situating it when, within a long one that wrecks itself away from cooptation and management and towards something else, maybe a radical politics of solidarity, but within all its messiest messiness of work of community work and coalition building. So, That's beautiful, you. Vincent. Thank you so much. That's uh, I, I was just going to break in, but I'm so happy I didn't have to because that was a perfect end. And we're now going to hear from Grace Lee, who. You know, you can read her amazing bio in the in the chat, but you probably hopefully all know American Revolutionary, the evolution of Grace Lee Boggs. But I just found myself recently looking back at K-Town 92, the multimedia piece. So, Grace, happy to hear from you. Welcome. Right, th thank you, Ruby, and thank you for inviting me to be on this illustrious panel. Um, I'm not really on a lot of panels with academics, so I'm, I'm <laughs> feeling like increasingly smart as I listen to everyone. So um, I guess I just have a few comments related to being an Asian American documentary filmmaker in this moment, as well as someone who's invested in where the field of documentary is going in general. Um, one of the things that I that came to mind when I was given the prompt um, was, you know, when thinking about this past year, and everything that has happened, you know, in terms of Asian Americans, um, the violence against Asian Americans, you know, what happened in Atlanta, you know, I was very grateful to have worked, you know, I did two episodes of the Asian American series. And, you know, when it was sort of re-upped on streaming from PBS, it was a really, um, I, I felt really uh, consoled that this is a resource that we could, you know, sort of offer to the general public and community for free, because, you know, even working on an Asian American history series, you just realize just how erased this history is from American history. Um, and even as somebody who cares about this kind of history and is working on the film, there are so many elements of it that I didn't even know. And, you know, it was, um, you know, so much of my work, I feel, has been about correcting the record and understanding what our history is. And also, you know, when it comes to Atlanta, for example, um, just seeing the backgrounds of the women who were killed, you know, and understanding like there's a whole history of like, you know, um, immigration, American wars in Asia, you know, the gendered violence that, uh, you know, where these women were targeted because they were Asian women, all of these things, you just sort of understand like, wow, we don't know anything and you know maybe I should move to Illinois and start you know 
right there. <laughs> well, starting to learn this stuff. Um, anyway, um, on a personal note, you know, I've also worked on projects that are about some of these characters or, you know, people who are kind of correcting our understanding of what history is, you know, somebody like Grace Lee Boggs or Ruby, thanks for mentioning Cape Town 92 about the LA uprising civil unrest of 1992 that bring out perspectives that the media ignores on every single anniversary. There's another one coming up next year. So let's see what happens there. Um, I think one of the commonalities of these projects that attracts me to them is that they are about kind of these hidden figures, these organizers, activists, who are also fighting back to reclaim their story and their history, whether it's uncovering violence or examining the roots of it, or simply providing a perspective we've never seen before. Um, and, you know, one thing that I thought about over the last year a lot is that there have always been organizers, you know, Renee, like when we were working on the May 19th project and also Asian Americans, there's this long history of violence against Asians, but there's always been like a history of people, um, you know, fighting to reclaim, you know, their community, self-determination, all of these things. And it was exciting to work on the episode about sort of the birth of consciousness of Asian Americans and, you know, the Filipino farm workers, you know, the ethnic studies strike at San Francisco State. Um, kind of just replacing these histories with stories that maybe I'd heard of a little bit, you know, like uh, in my journey, but really sort of diving as deep as you can in an hour into these stories was really important. Um, you know, and in terms of, um, on another note, sorry, I'm all over the place, but um, one of the things that has also kept me sane over the last few years is the organizing within our own Asian American documentary community. Um, both Renee and Bao and I and Brian and others, you know, Melissa, um, we're all part of ADOC, the Asian American Documentary Network, which was kind of born out of a long history of storytellers, Asian American storytellers organizing ourselves. But in this case, in 2016, we wanted to build something that would uplift and share resources for Asian American filmmakers in this generation, you know, from emerging to veteran. Um, and then we're, we're in our fifth year now. And if people are interested, they can go to adoc.org to learn more about what we do. Um, and related to that, I, it's been heartening to see um, how Asian Americans in the documentary field are very active in building movements that affect the entire documentary world. Um, if people here weren't aware, you know, we just passed the one year anniversary of Gita Gandabir, you know, also she was a filmmaker on Asian Americans, she's in ADOC. Um, her kind of calling out of the Tiger Woods documentary um, sparked the formation of the Beyond Inclusion Collective, which is a BIPOC led collective of filmmakers, which asks questions about, you know, who gets to tell the story, sort of power dynamics within documentary. Um, and, you know, even Beyond, Beyond Inclusion has been involved in uh, sort of efforts that I've been involved in with asking questions about public media, whether it's meeting its public mandate of um, reflecting the entire American public, uh, you know, and a diversity of perspectives. Um, and, you know, we have decision makers, like see some of them in the room, like Chi Wei Yang uh, at Ford Just Films, Kathy M at MacArthur, Ho Si Tang, who's the director of funds at the International Documentary Association. It matters to have these folks in these positions. And, you know, somebody who mentored me a long time ago, Lonnie Ding, you know, I'm only now uncovering just how much Lonnie's work, both as a documentary filmmaker and an organizer in the field, you know, um, resonates today. So, uh, you know, it's not just filmmakers, it's also critics, scholars like you all, um, programmers, uh, executives, you know, these are, these are, this is the ecosystem in which we're trying to Great. sort of make change. So, Great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, and that's the perfect uh, toss off to Brian, uh, speaking of infrastructures. So Brian Hugh, who's joining us from San Diego State, but is also, as some of you know, a film festival impresario and um, has uh, his own point of view to bring to this. Brian. Thank you, Ruby. Um, yeah, and, and like Ruby, I'm, I'm really heartened by this um, Illinois mandate for Asian American studies, which I certainly didn't see coming. And I like thinking about uh, tying this to Grace's point about you know, telling, having the opportunity now to tell the truth of Asian American history. And I, I really hope that this will lead to an uptick in demand for educational resources in the classroom, which I hope means more funding for not just schools, but also documentary filmmakers. And that reminds me of that, I mean, that's how a lot of visual communications work was first funded in the 1970s through ethnic studies initiatives. 
Um, so I had to just, I was starting to think about like different genres of, of Asian American historical documentaries and like how they can be useful. Um, and of course there's like these general usage encyclopedic works. And I think PBS's Asian American series, the May 19th project is a really exemplary in that respect. Um, I also wanted to, to shout out Tim Tsai and the, one of the, the attendees and his film Sea Drift is a great example of um, sort of like telling, uh, uncovering histories of Asian America. So for, for, for today, I just wanted to focus on another sort of genre of Asian American historical documentary. And I'm calling this like the hero genre. So like documentaries about Patsy Mink and Jeremy Lin. And then within that, there's like a subgenre that I want to call the intersectional hero. So that's like Rhea Tajiri's Yuri Kochiyama doc. And of course, Grace's American Revolutionary. Um, I would even include to some extent um, Bao's film Be Water on Bruce Lee. And so maybe I think it's because of these in intersectional hero docs and that fact that they're being shown in schools that this past year I've seen a huge uptick in social media videos and projects that are related to Black Asian solidarity. And I've seen that in so many of these projects, including the ones that are being submitted to the San Diego Asian Film Festival, like right now, I'm seeing like this, the, same, the usage of the same set of what I might call like exemplary historical images of solidarity. So we, we keep seeing repeated like the image of Yuri and Malcolm. Uh, this image of Grace Lee Boggs and James Boggs, like, kind of like, like a loving image. Uh, and I'm especially seeing used over and over again images of Richard Aoki in his Black Panthers beret, um, or of Asian Americans in the 1970s carrying free Huey signs or Yellow Peril supports Black Power signs. And I've been thinking about how like the citation of these images of solidarity, like what, what is the affective power of them? Um, how are we as documentary viewers or social media users meant to react to these kinds of historical images? Um, my guess is that they're cited to instill a kind of a productive shock to remind a younger generation of Asian American activists that they're actually part of a really long tradition and to remind them that the concept of Asian American is by definition tied to struggles for all oppressed people. And then by tying it to the birth of Asian American movements, um, these images argue that solidarity is the natural condition of Asian America, that solidarity has been there all along and the history reminds us to reclaim this legacy. And this is great. I mean, I'm glad that this kind of sentiment is, exists and that it's being circulated. But I was actually thinking about like, are there other ways to cite solidarity in Asian American documentary? And then once again, I'm reminded of Ursula Liang's Down a Dark Stairwell, which Vincent uh, mentioned. And he also mentioned a lot of the reasons why this is actually a really difficult movie to watch. Um, it shows how messy Asian American politics are. Um, just speaking personally, it's a very stressful movie. Um, and it's a kind of stress that makes me wonder about the efficacy of the term Asian American altogether, especially within these limited notions of identity politics. And then the ending of the film doesn't resolve any of these tensions. Instead, the film ends with citations of solidarity. So out of nowhere, after these 80 minutes of this excruciating friction, we get a montage of those very same images I mentioned that everyone else is citing too, like Grace Lee Boggs and James Boggs, Yuri Kochiyama, the free Huey signs. And then watching this montage at the end of Down a Dark Stairwell, I'm overcome with a very different kind of affect than the citations of solidarity that we've seen in the hero documentaries or the recent solidarity social media projects. Um, the images in the film fill me with only like a very tenuous kind of hope. Suddenly these images make me feel that there's nothing natural about Asian American history or black Asian solidarity at all. So here citing historical solidarity reminds us that uh, doesn't remind us that we've, but what we've been all along. Um, it makes us feel like solidarity it might actually be inorganic, but it reminds us that it is hard, it's painful, it's sometimes ineffectual, uh, but it's work that we have ahead of us. Um, so while we still need these kind of hero documentaries because Yuri Kochiyama and Grace Lee Boggs are still our role models and we need to know what is possible, I hope that this mandate for Asian American studies also requires us to look at Asian American history and solidarity movements as unfinished and sometimes ugly and very stressful business. Wow, thank you for that uh, rallying cry, Brian, that was great. And we'll get back to that, I'm sure, in the discussion. And um, I appreciate all of you being here today, but I have to especially give kudos uh, to our next panelist, uh, Ba Win, who's uh, very, very, with great self-sacrifice, joining us from Khan. So <laughs> thank you, Ba. Um, you know him as the filmmaker of Be Water, uh, but you can see everything in the chat. 
and uh, turning it over to you, Bao. Thank you so much, Ruby. Again, it's, it's such an honor to be part of this panel and uh, with such an esteemed, um, you know, as other speakers. And as Grace was saying, I'm not an academic either, so I'm I'm going to be probably a little all over the place. Um, but uh, I I think you know this conversation. A lot of it, us have talked about it internally a lot and publicly a lot. And um, I think now that we're in July and we've been given sort of this critical distance from the month of May where we were all were really busy talking about this all the time, I think. Um, it, it's good to to kind of have, yeah, that that sort of uh, catharsis or lamentation in, in this space. And I feel like this is a, a safe space in, in many ways. Um, you know, the month of May and April were really busy for me because there was a lot of projects that I wanted to do that addressed, you know, the idea of stop Asian hate. I think the idea of stop Asian hate it's such a bare minimum of what we should be asking for as a community, right? Um, we should be celebrating our beauty and our joys through our achievements and, and also our struggles. And for me, um, Be Water was a, a sort of a tribute to the whole community. Um, it was something, it was a film about Bruce Lee um, that played on ESPN and, and premiered at Sundance last year. And um, I re remember thinking it would, I was a bit worried because it was almost like a burden, right, to tell the story of Bruce Lee. But I think I felt it was such a privilege. I, I shifted the idea and made it a privilege because as an Asian American, there's never been an Asian American who did a feature documentary about Bruce Lee, which is nuts. Everything has been told through a white, usually a white male perspective. And, and that, given that privilege, I knew that those were the, types of stories that I wanted to tell through the Asian American lens, right? And I think white Hollywood, as, as Shannon Lee put it so eloquently a, a week ago, is white Hollywood has been trying to tell the Bruce Lee story all the time. They should kind of step back. And and to be given that agency was, was an honor. And um, that's something I, I want to continue to do in my work. I, I'm, I'm fairly young and, and early and been mentored by many people on this panel. So um, I'm still learning about what um, my role is as, a, as an Asian American filmmaker. But what I've, I've seen in just the past year, again, um, having the privilege to, to tell stories about our community is that instead of catering to sort of a wide sort of quote unquote, you know, um, public audience or whatever audiences that people want to tell me that I should be making films for, I want to make films that are unapologetically honest and, and authentic to my point of view. I think for a long time, filmmakers, especially documentary filmmakers, have been told we can't tell objective stories because we're too close to the material or something. And I wanted to kind of claim the idea that subjectivity is something that can be celebrated in, in film and art nowadays, right? And that there's something um, honest and, and beautiful about having that subjective um, viewpoint because I, in, in the, in this past year, the pandemic, um, you know, I, I, I kind of looked inward a bit, but also saw the shared humanity of, of what everyone was going through. And um, the idea that documentary is dealing with real people, uh, I think there is room for a more humanistic approach and a less transactional approach in, in what we do in many ways. Um, and so that that's, yeah, that's how I look at not just API documentary, but all, all documentary forms and storytelling forms in general. Um, and I've earlier in the, in the uh, panel, we saw a short clip from my music video that I did for Y Club Sean and MC Jin. And um, that was something that came together. We produced and, you know, released that in three weeks. And I think given how quickly a lot of this news has been happening, I, I wanted to sort of shift and, and make these sort of rapid response projects that could, um, you know, do what they can to introduce new audiences to the work of Renee. You know, Renee was kind enough to let me use some footage from Who Killed Vincent Chin. And those are images that a lot of young people have never seen before, right? Um, and then also, from visual communications letting me into that archive and and i think i'm trying to almost make these pieces into a trojan horses right where you think you're getting a rap video but you're also getting a very quick 
and I know you, you know you should definitely get a deeper dive into Asian American history, but as many ways that we can kind of create these connections and bridges across, you know, generations across time, because I think there, uh, as Brian said, there's a long tradition of this fight and this movement, and it isn't new. And I want to find ways that we can continue to welcome people who are just starting to learn about this movement and and we. A lot of people have had this internal racism, right? That they felt like they can't speak up or felt like they were still finding their identity. And I think identity is something that's always evolving. And I, I wanna continue again to, to welcome people who are finding that um, and, and feel welcome into the movement uh, that you know individuals like Renee and Grace um, have been forming for so long. Um, so yeah, I wanted to end on, on this one last note that Ocean, you know, one of my, I, I consider him like the Asian American James Baldwin, but he's his own person in his own right, Ocean Wong. And he says, you know, to be gorgeous, you must first be seen, but to be seen allows you to be hunted. And I think we have been trying to be seen for so long and, and at this moment we feel seen, but in many ways we are being hunted. So how do we, as storytellers, as filmmakers, get in front of that and, and, and celebrate ourselves but also prevent us to, in being hunted in many ways with, with what was has been going on in the past year. Thanks, Bob. That's um, really, really bracing, really a, an emotional way to end that. Um, let's continue on. I'm sure we're gonna come back to that in the, in the discussion. Um, we're hearing next from uh, Melissa Pruksachart. Uh, this is your second uh, webinar, Melissa, and we had to have her back and um, uh, she's at the University of Michigan, though not at this minute, and I'm really uh, eager to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Melissa. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm also going to quote Ocean Vong at the end, so just a heads up. Um, well, first, I want to thank Ruby and Brian for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, and I also want to thank Ruby and Film Quarterly for long recognizing the political, critical, and aesthetic importance of Asian American media making. When we started communicating about the Asian American Film at 50 issue back in 2019, I didn't imagine that it would be laying the foundation for something so urgent in 2021. So my remarks have two parts. First, I will talk about violence and then I will talk about documentary. Um, so this past decade has built a large and thrilling movement in defense of black life against the prison industrial complex and the police and towards the expansion of abolition. Yet in the wake of increased anti-Asian violence, Asian American liberals have coalesced and come to political consciousness around the very idea of expanding the carceral state through the rhetoric of hate crime and the expansion of law enforcement activities, as if the past decade had taught them precisely nothing. The critique of hate crime rhetoric and legislation has a longer history in radical queer and trans movements. And in May of this year, more than 100 Asian American and LGBTQ organizations jointly signed a statement condemning, not supporting, the passage of the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act in the U.S. Senate. They write, quote, while we wish we could celebrate the historical uh, visibility of anti-Asian violence and racism, which is, as old, which is as old as the colonization of the Americas, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act contradicts Asian solidarity with Black, Brown, undocumented, trans, low-income, sex worker, and other marginalized communities whose liberation is bound together. Furthermore, the bolstering of law enforcement and criminalization does not keep us safe and in fact harms and furthers violence against Asian communities facing some of the greatest disparities and attacks. So Asian communities that include sex workers, low wage workers, people with disabilities, people with li li living with HIV, youth, women, trans and non-binary people, migrants amongst others. It also ignores that police violence is also anti-Asian violence, which has disproportionately targeted Black and Brown Asians. And for those interested in pursuing this line of thinking, um, Tamara K. Knopper is giving an online presentation on the politics of crime data on July 27, and I can post a link to that later. So the reactionary pro-police stance Asian American liberals bring um, to mind Erin Koinin's observation that the model minority is not a myth, but more of an identity that many Asian Americans choose time and time again. She wrote back in 2014 that we train our students to retort that the model minority is a figment of the white imagination. We tell them that statistics lie, that Asians are not doing so well. Look at the Southeast Asians, they're in gangs, but it is a red herring and a disingenuous case to make. 
the heart of the issue is not whether Asian immigrant families currently meet the measures of the model minority. The issue is whether they aspire to and whether they apply those metrics, and they do. Um, the model minority is, is not um, held at bay by bulbs of garlic. It is invited to dine, made part of the nuclear family, unquote. In the final part of my remarks, I want to gesture to the larger suspicions around the concepts of story and storytelling that have been preoccupying documentary filmmakers and critics lately, namely in this summer's Beyond Story study group convened by World Records Journal, the Sheffield Doc Fest, and Union Docs. Alex Juhaz and Elisa Lebeau explain, quote, during a time when more documentaries are finding larger viewerships than ever before, we note an ominous reduction of the form's capacious ability to surprise, revise, and otherwise upend cultural and ideological conventions, unquote. This was, to my mind, a return to um, Chun Min Ha's famous assertion, infamous assertion, from 1990 that there is no such thing as documentary. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Asian American film and video makers such as Chin, Lonnie Ding, Richard Fung, Ray Tajiri, and Marlon Fuentes were at the forefront of challenging the formal and narrative binaries between fact and fiction as a way of adequately grasping at Asian American life. And Peter Fung, who's here today, also gestured to this in his essay, Ethnography, the Cinematic Apparatus, and Asian American Film Studies. Um, relatedly, the team at Sentient Art Film, including Abby Sun, who's here today in the audience, um, have been instrumental in reconstituting this body of work for contemporary audiences, and they're currently running a Bontoc eulogy disarticulation project that the general public can participate in, and I'll also drop a link to that in the chat. So in the face of legibility, quantification, and documentation, I want to posit a return to an elaboration of these anti-empirical styles of um, these modes of seeing and knowing. So in closing, I echo Ocean Vong's remark that to be an Asian American writer, artist, or poet is to be unfathomable and to be inconceivable. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Melissa. A lot, a lot to talk about. Um, we're going to open this up now, but first we're going to pause for just two minutes, I think. Um, for a short Grace Lee piece, and then we'll be back with you. Evolution is not linear. Time interacts. History is a story not only of the past, but of the future. I'm not sure why I am who I am. I think it does have something to do with the fact that I was born female and born Chinese. My parents came here as immigrants. I went to college at Barnard at the age of 16. College in those days was still very much an upper class culture. It all seemed barren to me. Something seemed wrong. I felt from the very beginning that there were changes that needed to take place. Politics of the time said Detroit is where the workers are. That's where you need to be. I had never met anybody like him before. I was a Chinese American living in an African American community and saw myself as a part of and apart from the community. I don't think whites understand the degree to which Negroes do not want their whiteness. I became so active in the Black Power movement that FBI records of that time say that I was probably Afro-Chinese. <laughs> you don't choose the times you live in, but you do choose who you want to be, and you do choose how you want to think. How many Negroes do we want to give up to please the white man? Negroes are being killed every day. How many more? Please. Expanding our imaginations is what is required.
Okay, really happy to be back here and to hear from all of you, each of you, um, what you'd like to add. I'm, I'm going to start with you, Renee, because I cut you off grievously while you were just getting going. And you've also had the longest time to listen to everyone else. Um, thanks, uh, Grace, for that wonderful piece, too, before we get going back to talk. Be, it's just terrific. So, Renee, um, where would you like to start? What's on your mind after hearing all of this? Yeah, I, I mean, a lot is on my mind. I, you know, I think that this idea of going back to what Vincent's saying about what Kent's referring to Kent and this idea of re-signing um, the, the identity of Asian Americans, I kind of see also with Asian American films, it's identity lives, but I think the films and the interpretation of films live. And so I, for example, you know, my first film, Who Killed Vincent Chin, I found it very distressing by the 90s in that not just the way people read the film, but just looked at the Vincent Chin story um, was, you know, some people looked at it in terms of Asian American grievance and not justice. And grievance is like white identity is built on grievance. And I can see that happening today with Stop AAPI Hate. I mean, Stop AAPI Hate is a powerful movement, but it can go into two directions. It can go into the direction of, you know, find, finding um, modes of solidarity and, and, and justice or it could go the direction of grievance. And I think you've seen it, we've seen it go the direction of grievance. So, you know, after the Atlanta shootings, there were the congressional hearings around hate crime um, legislation and the Republican members spent the whole time talking about discrimination towards Asian Americans in affirmative action programs. And I think even the history of hate crime um, legislation and measures as a response to racial violence, if you look at it, I mean, that was the fight during the Vincent Chin case, the fight for Asian Americans to be recognized on a federal level as a legal class and protected by civil rights leg legislation, which was um, you know, a, a real victory that it's the first time it happened. But the fight was also for an enhanced penalties and hate, you know, it wasn't called hate crimes at that time, but um, you know, this kind of carceral response response to um, to racial violence. And you can see over time how, I mean, today, from what I understand, the hate crime um, um, prosecutions are disproportionately used against Black people, actually, Black defendants. Um, and the, it was amazing to me how quickly people accepted um, you know, even Asian Americans in Congress and many Asian Americans accepted um, this, this um, um, solution to anti-Asian violence is coming in, you know, I don't think they, that po more policing was a part of that measure, but I think that was happening um, in like in New York City and, and different places. And, you know, I, I know they focus on data, but it did open up this possibility of um, more boots on the ground again, and you know, longer prison sentences. And I, I when it's, so when it's, you know, to go back to the analogy of filmmaking, when when the films are disconnected from a critique of white supremacy and systemic racism, I think that becomes the problem. That's where you know you um, these stories can be wielded as these examples of grievance. Well, people don't like us. We got to protect ourselves and. Um, you know, for many Asian Americans, they think it's black and brown people are the ones that, that don't like them and, and are attacking them, as I said, because they're looking at these these viral videos out there, which are very intentionally, I think, being pushed out to shape a kind of a narrative of um, black and brown criminality and to, you know, align with this movement towards um, this, you know, more authoritarian kind of partial state and, and, and and really, you know, as Melissa was was saying, really um, targeting a black, brown, and indigenous populations. Um, and I, you know, later it'd be interesting to talk about specific films because I think that when you know you have, I'll, I'll just close by saying um, what Brian 
talked about with Down the Dark Stairwell, I had the same feeling of stress watching it alone um, because I thought there was, well, there's a false equivalency um, to give so much time to the Chinese Americans who were supporting Peter Leong, a New York um, police officer who shot this innocent guy who just walked out into the stairwell because the elevator wasn't working and left him to bleed out. And so, you know, and some of them were even invoking um, you know, the name of Vincent Chin as, you know, being uh, the, that Peter Leong was a scapegoat like Vincent Chin. But so, you know, you have this, this cop who kills this guy, lets him bleed out on the one hand, then you have the innocent victim uh, who never saw justice. And so I don't think that's equivalent. But then when I've seen the film in this kind of situation where there's been discussion, Ursula has been there and there, it's been you know, really powerful. Film. So I think that context, um, if it's not necessarily in film, if it's in, you know, conversation around the film, um, could be really, really powerful tool. Great. Thanks, Renee. That's really helpful. Um, I want to hear from the rest of you. Um, we've been hearing different solutions uh, uh, for entering into this conversation in a different way on the part of the filmmakers. Um, from you, Bao, about the music videos and um, Grace and and um, Renee both with the Asian American series and Grace Bao and Renee all of you on on the, the May nineteenth project. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit from the writers, the academics, the film festival mavens about where change can come. There, I mean, how does one intervene in these um, insufficient or you know outright dishonest dialogues happening on a national level? Would, not, not to silence Bao and Grace, please, but just to sort of broaden this out. What are, what are, what are you thinking? Uh, do you see ways forward? Um, I'm really curious. I'll jump in here, because I've been, I've been thinking about this, you know, um, idea about film festivals and their role within AAPI um, media making. So, you know, I want to give a shout out to, to Chi Wei and Brian for being really influential and in making sure I'm um, a part of these conversations, especially early on in the late, uh, early tens, late aughts. Um, I'm confused on my decades these days. <laughs> um, and I think this really touches upon what Renee was talking about is really what is, where are these places where we have these conversations, right? And as Bao talks about um, B. Water as this kind of Trojan horse about Asian American uh, politics and history in relationship to Bruce Lee for an ESPN audience. I think about film festivals as these kind of unique spaces where conversations can have under a, a guise of entertainment, right? That I think the role of film festivals um, is to really, and not only the role, but their kind of um, importance and niche is that like, you can see the people you're watching a movie with. You can see the people who are um, developing or um, producing the movie and have conversations. We can You can have a conversation with the film festival uh, director who is selecting these films for you all um, and having these particular spaces to frame that conversation because what you, you know generally don't want to do is release them onto the internet after they watch it on Netflix to then have conversations on Reddit or, you know, if they're, um, uh, I mean, maybe Reddit can be good, but, you know, let's think about the, 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 the other depths of the internet that might take a text and make it about, you know, to watch down a dark stairwell and thinking about it purely under a guise of, of um, not justice, but about, you know, Chinese American grievance politics. Um, how do we have these conversations that even allow for that? Because I think in the end, actually, people really want to have the space to do that. Um, they need a way to process those affective things in which we're queued up into, right? These images that make us come to terms or rethink or do a productive shock. Like that's where we then can make an intervention um, and do something that brings people into um, a dialogue. Um, and I, to me, I, I've been kind of thinking about this um, over a period of time and, and Brian and Chiwei, thank you very much for, for like uh, extending and helping me think about this through film film festivals and film and cinema studies in itself. So um, I want to give a shout out to those three folks. Great. 
don't know if Brian or or dis disagrees or agrees with me on this. I just want to be in my head. Yeah. <laughs> well, it does make me kind of nostalgic for 2019. Remember that, like when we had film festivals. <laughs> um, but also, like, it has me thinking about like Renee and Bao and Grace. I mean, you've you've all had such an, like immense projects these last couple of years. I'm curious, like, what has what what's gone like it has not being in a film festival, not being in these kinds of spaces been. You feel you feel like something's been stolen from you. But I think partly it's because of what um, Vince you're saying about joy, and I think value related to joy also. It's the Trojan horse. Um, I mean, webinars are really great. I'm so grateful for them. But I don't think people usually go into webinars seeking joy. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Ruby. Um, and, and so and so this is where like to me the cinephilic is still crucial. Um, that people want to watch documentaries because they think they're going to be really great, and then there's a way in which something else happens to them through the conversation. And, I'm, and as much as I love um, online conversations this last year, it feels more than ever, at least from my perspective, a more self-selected group, as opposed to the people who kind of accidentally went in, went in to a film festival. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. See, that's so, that's so interesting, um, Brian, because I think one could also make the opposite argument that a film festival plays to a self-selected group able to afford tickets, already aware of it and going to things, whereas something that's online uh, maybe not a webinar, okay, but that something's online. Uh, maybe it's Bao's music video. Uh, maybe it's uh, one of um, Grace's or Renee's shorter pieces. Um, maybe those are the, 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 tr the true Trojan horses that get stumbled upon. So I'm wondering from all of you, how do we link these nodes? How do we create these kinds of networks that can pull people in, you know, I, I always think of a lobster trap that, you know, you see something and you're curious and you go in and the next thing you know, you're in this, this space. Well, I guess that's not a very good analogy since you're trapped, but the opposite, that you're in a space that opens up into, uh, into this world that's interconnected. Um, what's, what has this past year and a half taught us? Um, uh, IRL with violence on the sidewalks versus an open world online in the home. Where, where do we go with this as we begin to emerge in this confusing 2021 moment? What are you thinking? What do you wanna see happening next? What, do you, what are all of your next steps? I wanna hear. Um, I, I can just, I mean, I feel cheated out of not going to festivals last year, having two big projects that were, you know, supposed to premiere at these places and then it was all online. But at the same time, I also enjoyed the online access to, for example, I never had a better Sundance Film Festival. I didn't have to go there. You know, I like got to be an avatar in this weird room and like talk to people. And it was, it was just a, a strange <laughs> new kind of experience, which I was excited about because there was nothing except I've just been in this Zoom background for like the last year and a half, right? Um, so, you know, there's mixed feelings about that. Um, in terms of like the nodes, like if we're talking about Asian American documentary world, like, you know, ADOC never became more like um, connected than in the pandemic. You know, people who weren't, you know, were looking for a place to go. We, we were having these sort of, um, we had these kind of in real life meetups, which are about to start up again, finally. But you know, we we started having these happy hours on ADOC, you know, Zoom conversations, which weren't that popular before because everybody had their own life. But it, it felt interest. It was it was an interesting thing to observe happen that wouldn't have happened except for this moment. And there were things to talk about with all of the violence happening with you know everything, you know, in in the world, the, the pandemic, etc. Um, so I is just a plug for ADOC again. <laughs> Um, I'll put a link in the chat if people are interested, but I think, you know, it's, again, it's an ecosystem. It's not just filmmakers, it's writers, curators, programmers, academics, executives, fans, you know, who connect to the Asian American documentary experience or nonfiction world, whatever that means. Um, just, just to add to that conversation, this conversation, um, I'm again, really spoiled because I'm at Cannes right now and it, it feels amazing to be at a film festival and to be at Cannes is, it, it was one of the festivals that Be Water was invited to last year, but it got canceled. And and so uh, they they uh, they invited me this year, but for, unfortunately we're not screening the film. But I think, you know, there's so many lessons to be learned from the pandemic. And I think it's, 
you, you know, I don't, we, we're going to have to live in this hybrid world of having Zoom with, you know, in-person events. And I think if we were all, if it was possible that we were all in the same room doing this conversation, but we can also broadcast it out in the world, that would be ideal for me because, you know, Zoom and, and me looking at a screen is an abstraction of a person, right? It is an abstract, abstraction of experience. It's not, I want that embodied experience of talking to someone in person. And I think that we'd probably, probably have a deeper conversation, to be honest. Uh, not to say that this conversation is not deep already, but there's something about seeing someone breathe and, and, and you know, having this atmosphere of a room. And um, so, I mean, I, I hope that, yeah, lessons are learned from this experience. Right? I hope we didn't come out of a year and a half of being at home and not learn anything. And we just go back to the life that we had before it. But I think there are ways that we can think about, um, you know, just today they're at Cannes, they, they play this documentary Revolution of Our Times, which is about the Hong Kong protests. And it was a, a secret screening for specific journalists. And that's something I think is the power of a film festival um, to kind of create this buzz. Um, and, you know, everyone was talking about it at the festival, right? And then it can spread out through you know, other modes of, of communication, like the internet. And so I think um, there just has to be intention behind every single event, every single panel, and, and what works best as a whole, rather than specifically, I guess. That's that's an interesting example you just ended with because, in a way, uh, the journalists come from the film out of the film festival and spread the word of this. Sadly, journalists don't cover webinars. There's there's a problem. There's a real problem. So that's that is part of it. The in person, of course, is is what we all crave. But I think that's also um, a point in terms of what's what gets covered. What's what's a beat, you know? Um, but I want to let me get out of the way. I want to hear more the rest of you. What about the form of documentary? I mean, Melissa, you threw down the gauntlet as has already been done uh, over the past year or two. Um, and I, I personally have a different position. I'll be curious to hear from the rest of you. Um, you know, how important is narrative? How recognizable are divergent narrative approaches? Um, what needs to be taken into account? And what has opened up through the short forms you know, what does each, each form does something and doesn't do something else? And how do you make your choices uh, with what to make, what to watch, what to teach? What's going on now? Have we all been permanently changed by Zooms or are we all going back to something that was there before? What's your thinking on this? I think, I think people are very practical and resilient. So there's a pandemic, you have to teach remotely, or show films remotely, you get the best out of it. I mean, I, I had a experience teaching an Asian American independent film history class, like last spring in the middle of the pandemic, it was um, um, remote, of course. And so I was bringing in guest filmmakers every week. And you know, I was able to bring in Ham Tran, who made Journey from the Fall. He was in Vietnam, but he you know stayed up late to to um, come in and, and one of my students who was Vietnamese from a ref, refugee family, their family actually, when that film came out, bought the, I think it was like a VHS or like a tape. And every year the family looks at that film together because the film is based upon um, Ham and his producers interviews with like hundreds of, of refugees. Um, and so it was so close to them. So when Ham was there and, you know, the students were able to ask questions, I made sure she could ask questions. Her mother, you know, peeked in and she was so excited that Ham was right there. And, you know, it's the first time she had watched because her father had just died of COVID. It was the first time the family was able to re-watch re his film and to meet the filmmaker and have that connection was so amazing. And, and I think by the same token, the way we show films, the way we make films and the kinds of films we make, you know, we just kind of like, I, as I said, all of us, Grace, Bao and I, we all make long form documentaries, but then, you know, we just re kind of version the way we do things to meet the times, to meet the needs, meet the moment. Um, it's not easy because if you, if you have a long form mind, like to think about making a two minute piece where the first, you know, 
five seconds has to grab the audience or they're going to turn it off and go to something else. I mean, that's very hard. Or even like a TikTok, if it's over 60 seconds, now they made it three minutes. But just a few months ago, if it was over 60 seconds, um, you know, they, they couldn't show the content. Um, but, but, you know, I think that the community of filmmakers, as is our community, is very, um, very pragmatic. And we do what we have to do to tell these stories. Thanks, Renee. Someone else, other thoughts? I, if I could just throw that question to, to Grace okay. quickly, because I think what Renee is talking about is a certain like translating thing, like to the translation of Grace Lee Boggs, the, the feature to a short. Uh, I'm curious like how you thought about that as translation, um, both like a, a format translation, but also like a intergenerate like cross generations. Um, but also like, I think so much of your, the future, the future documentary is about a certain journey and, and how you thought about that on, in a shorter form. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, Renee said you have two minutes <laughs> and <laughs> sort, of, sort of the way that we thought about it, me and Victoria, the editor was just, okay. I mean, if you've never heard of Grace Lee Boggs before, like, and you saw this thing on Instagram, like what would compel you to be intrigued? I mean, that's basically it. Cause what can you do in two minutes? You know, it's not that much. And so this idea um, that I've been thinking about a lot is of ancestral intelligence, as opposed to artificial intelligence is just this idea, word co combination of words. I wanted to get out there because I think about it a lot in terms of Grace Lee Boggs was, and it sort of like built from there, you know, and then we just had this idea for like that kind of weird matrix thing. And then let's like, grab them and then you know if you see anything here that seems intriguing like perhaps you might go and find the film someday or find one of her books or google her or something like that that was basically the objective cool i like this i like this idea of translation that you introduced brian and i i like that explanation grace i mean in terms of it's almost like co coded messages in a bottle thrown out into the world and then to, to try to create, uh, you know, not just recognition, but an impact that will send people into a further discovery. And that's a very interesting way to think about it, I think. Um, I mean, can I just yeah. say, like, yeah, 892 was the same thing. I mean, there was, you know, in terms of how do we decide what kind of form to make a film? I mean, that one was really just what are the resources that we have now? And, you know, shout out to visual communications, like the archival um, interviews that, Linda Mabala and others shot, you know, right after the 1992 LA Rebellion, you know, that's the archival kind of community voice in that piece alongside these kind of problematic media depictions of, you know, communities of color looting and police and all of that stuff alongside, you know, the interviews, like really simple, like oral history filmed interviews with, you know, firsthand Angelinos talking about their experiences. And then they all sort of come together in this web experience that is constantly shifting. It's, it's, it's randomized, you know? Um, and so the idea was just like, there is no narrative that you can follow. There's no like author authoritarian narrative about what happened. Here's just a, you know, like you come in and you just sort of experience it, right? Um, and that was, that sort of came out of necessity and also the the desire to do something different, you know, to do something um, that sort of uh, kind of picked apart like this need to tell like this history from this point to this point with these particular, you know, familiar characters, right? These are unfamiliar characters in a format that you've never seen, but it's accessible to you at any time. So. That's great. That's great. Um... What I want to do is start incorporating some of the questions that have come in the Q&A to open this up for all of you as panelists and for the audience. And I think I'm going to start with uh, Peter Fangs, um, who, uh, Peter, you thank everybody for these, I love it, you said these thoughtful provocations. And um, saying that, you know, uh, we know that AAPI immigrants outnumber native born, and that's why this history needs to be taught and always reconfigured, but then you ask the question, um, how should scholars and filmmakers address generational and class divisions within AAPI? Is the path forward to abandon AAPI unity for class-based alliances? 
Or is there a way to get the AAPI middle class to abandon their class interest in favor of real um, AAPI unity? And here he says he's thinking of the parents opposed to affirmative action and thinking also of Atlanta and the instance of Asians exploiting other Asians. So who amongst you would like to address that is a great, great question, Peter. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly jump in just to say that I guess this question makes me think about that it should be less about like, who do we want to be with? Like, not who are you or who do you want to be with, but what do you want? And, you know, maybe we can think about about it that way, that it's, you know, figure out what your politics are and what you're trying to accomplish and then, you know, work with people who, who want that rather than, um, I don't know, rather than, I guess, thinking about, uh, yeah, kind of this idea of like, you know, it, uh, maybe about this idea of like different solidarity groups. So thinking about like Black Asian solidarity or, or conflict. Um, I was kind of uh, thinking about what Brian said about, um, you know, the idea of solidarity uh, and Black Asian solidarity and, and how uh, Down a Dark Stairwell ends with that montage of solidarity, yet the conflict is, is not resolved. Um, and I was thinking about how the flip side of the concept of Black Asian solidarity is, um, and, and like the way that my students, when I taught this film in the spring, interpreted um, Down a Dark Stairwell is that is, is that of conflict, right? So they read the film as as arguing that Black and Asian communities are in conflict with one another, right? As if they were equal opponents. And, um, you know, and maybe that has something to do with, with what Renee mentioned about there being maybe, maybe too much time given to the um, Chinese American communities. But I think I, to me, I read the film as a really interesting um, sort of documentation of, of this, um, you know, the, the ways in which Chinese American communities rallied together by the thousands in cities, you know, all across America um, to protest this. Um, but, you know, so so students read this as a conflict uh, between two communities, right? Um, in a way that kind of evacuates the way and it, it's not a conflict between two communities, right? Black communities in regards to Peter Liang and Akai Gurley, they have no antagonism with Asian American communities, right? They read Peter Liang like through the lens of class, like as this killer cop. Right. Yet, meanwhile, um, the Chinese American communities are there to sort of assert that like black death is a non-event. Um, so I guess that's just to say that, um, yeah, I think it's so interesting kind of, you know, what Vincent and Brian and, and Peter are suggesting about the kind of like in, I don't know, inefficacy of, of Asian American right now. Um, you know, similar to the way that Latinx is kind of also crumbling. Um, I, I never really thought I would say this because I always really believed in, in sort of an Asian American um, coalitional identity, but I'm like becoming more convinced that there's a lot more to work through. Fantastic. Thank I'm, you. I'm, I want to jump on what Mel Melissa's talking about and, and Brian a little bit here. And um, I think this also somewhat connects to another project I'm I'm working on at the moment. Um, so I'm gonna, you know, give a shout out to one of the participants, Yi Feng Hu, who I'm working on a project um, interviewing a AAPI healthcare workers about their experiences of racism, um, giving, you know, healthcare, providing healthcare during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and what comes into to mind here is what Melissa was talking about, like these identity positions in which we're, we're taking up. And this, you know, not we, but like the API community takes up, you know, and how um, Brian talks about productive shocks and affective relations to these types of things and how do we disrupt or how do these identity positions get um, disrupted, right? And what we come here, you know, and, and some of my other work talks about this, this idea of like, what does it mean to be American? What is the narratives that frame us around that, right? The, about meritocracy, about we work hard, we do this and things are fine, but then does that get disrupted when meritocracy just doesn't matter? And um, um, how do you respond to that? And, you know, AAPI 
positions have been anywhere from like, well, we reassert that it does matter, right? So we're gonna just go all in on anti-affirmative action. And another way is to say, well, the whole system is kind of um, geared towards not not us, right? Not uh, people of color, they to, towards continual disenfranchisement of, of, of people of color. Um, and so I think this puts us in a, in, a, in a precarious position of how do we um, negotiate that? So when I watched Dar in a Dark Stairwell, and you know maybe I was also primed by watching uh, Renee's Asian Americans series, that what, what I really saw was not what you know. This is just me. Is like what I didn't see was necessarily conflict, but I saw um, grief, joy, and grief, right? within the black community of like, there's, this is, this is a tragedy. We know this happens, but there's joy in our community. <laughs> Whereas the Chinese American community was like grievance politics um, as an assertion of a particular narrative that they have found to be, or want to be true because that's their notion of America. Um, so here is, that's when I kind of think about like, what is, what do we mean by winning or losing, right? Especially towards the end of the film. I feel like I'm spoiling the film for everyone who hasn't watched it yet. Um, <laughs> but go watch as much as you can, as soon as you can. Um, is that like, there, you know, one of the activists on the Chinese American community is like, there is, there is no celebration here. Um, but it only for me, I don't know how, you know, there, uh, you know, someone died, there is no celebration. And that was to me a kind of like, oh, there's a point, like there, there's something there right that you can tap into but the grievance politics right as opposed to justice seems to be the thing that drives a particular subset of america um to align with a particular um notion of white supremacy so i so um i i don't have an answer peter <laughs> really what it comes down to um but these are some of the things i'm thinking about that um you know why when i kind of come back to you like renee grace and in Bao's work helps us think about different ways of being in the world. Um, and I think that's, you know, why I love teaching their work is to kind of both think about these things and have students also engage with them. Um, so, great, thank you. great. Thank you so much. I also want to say that uh, Yi Feng Hu is here in, in, in the, in, out there in, in the land of, of remote. So that's great. Yeah, go on. So, it, I mean, I think those two examples Peter gives are really interesting and, and uh, kind of speaks to this need for narrative shift. So in terms of affirmative action, the way the press has characterized like the Harvard lawsuit is the Asian American student lawsuit. In fact, the majority of Asian Americans support affirmative action. Um, the only students who testified in that lawsuit were like Sally Chen and, and, and also a, a Vietnamese student who you know, supported holistic admissions and, and race-based um, considerations in, in school admissions. The, as the Ed Bloom's people didn't even bother to testify. But I think that for even for liberal, like white liberal um, editors and journalists, it's kind of a relief. It's, oh, you know, the Asian Americans are the bad guy in, the, in this sense. Um, but, it, but if you, and I know, I think Hao Wu actually is making a documentary about the affirmative action um, in schools, and I'm not sure what his position is. But again, if it's like this false equivalency, uh, even though the majority of Asian Americans support affirmative action, but you have like the, you know, the pro and the anti, and it looks like, well, that's, you know, this Asian American position, I think that's problematic. Um, with in terms of the Atlanta shootings, that's another um, kind of, you saw how Asian Americans intervened in narrative shift like overnight. So the day after Aaron Long, um, you know, targeted three Asian businesses, gunned down eight people, including six Asian women, uh, the Cherokee County Sheriff, you know, had his, the, the press um, briefing, the, his spokesman, and said, well, we talked to Aaron Long, and he said he was just having a very bad day. Yesterday. Um, he had a sex addiction, it's got nothing to do with race. So you saw right away Asian American scholars, activists like uh, Red Canary Song, people who had worked with Asian American sex workers and um, uh, workers in massage parlors. You saw journalists. You saw all these people come in, into action. You know, the, the scholars talked about the 1875 Page Act, where Chinese women were targeted as being prostitutes, you know, hypersexual, as being carriers of disease you know, as being the expendable other and how that, you know, has um, been 
um, embedded in the American psyche up to the present day and how that could have been in the mind of, of Aaron Long in, in, in terms of race and misogyny. Um, you saw journalists who I know were fighting in the newsroom to tell the story and interpret the story. And, and um, if you look at the people they talked to, it's like they were talking to the right people, which was amazing. You don't often see that in the mainstream press. Um, so in that sense, you know, Asian Americans, creatives, scholars, activists, and this is the, that's what makes Asian American filmmaking. That's always made Asian American filmmaking. That made Asian American, you know, visual communications in the 1970s, the work of Lonnie Ding, um, that was the, the, the foundation. And that is, I think, foundational today. It's that kind of all hands on deck. Um, you know, we're really, when you talk about documentary in the social justice sense, we are a part of this kind of ecosystem, just as systemic racism is this ecosystem of cultural images and laws and policies. Um, the fight against and resistance to systemic racism also is an ecosystem of the data, the scholarship, the you know, theorizing, um, the creative kind of output um, and you know, communications to, to, and, and organizing. So, um, so thank you for those two examples, Peter. Gave me a chance to rant. Great, over. great. Um, I'm gonna, I, I know some of you may want to add on to here, but in the meantime, I'm gonna bring um, uh, Abe Farrar's really provocative question into here. It starts out as a, a, a question to Bao, but I think it's for all of you, because he's, he's referencing Bao's conclusion, quoting Ocean Vuong that you know, if, if it says, if Asian Americans aspire to be seen, but if in turn being seen is opening up to being hunted, then if we characterize the motion picture camera as our primary weapons, says Abe, then how do APAs subvert or turn around status as targets in order to reposition ourselves as the hunters? And if we're going big game hunting with our cameras, as it were, what is it that we're going after? and um, says he thinks that's pertinent to, for all the panelists, but especially those with motion picture camera careers. Um, I wonder if anybody wants to take this into the conversation and um, just say that it makes me laugh because in the 1970s, I was on a panel called The Camera is a, is a Weapon at the Alternative Cinema Conference <laughs> to try to rechart documentary. So some of these questions just don't go away. Anybody want to uh, take do anyone have anything to say to address that? Yeah, I'll start with you, Bob. Uh, yeah, I mean, just briefly, uh, thank you, Abe, for the question and 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 creating more metaphors within metaphors, uh, right? Um, so, I, for me, as a storyteller, right, as a filmmaker, um, and not to sound like self-aggrandizing, but I think narrative is so important to changing attitudes, right? And attitudes help to change policies. Policies don't just change on their own, right? Uh, there's an artist friend of mine who was a lawyer for the Innocence Project, but then he became an artist because he felt like yeah, policy was the last thing that he could change and culture and narrative was something that that was sort of the front lines of, of the battles and struggles that we go through as a society. Um, and so I, I, you know, I keep on quoting Vietnamese Americans, but I'm glad I have a big pool of people to, to quote, but, you know, Viet Thanh Nguyen talks about the idea of narrative plentitude, right? I think um, what we're trying to do as, as filmmakers, again, is is to create narrative plentitude about our community because there's been so much scarcity um, in the stories that have represented us and have been the only stories that represented us in so many ways. And I think uh, using motion picture cameras, uh, very old school way to talk about <laughs> um, things, but um, as a weapon to create more narrative plentitude, then that's where I see the battle is for us as filmmakers. And and when you think about how racism in a way was created like back in the 1400s in some way, narr narrative prolifer proliferated the idea of racism, right? That there was, a, there was a story that was created that a group of people were, you know, inferior to another group of people. And if narrative can proliferate proliferate racism, maybe it could help in its eradication as well. Okay, I like that hopefulness. Um, anyone else with ideas as to how that 
can be attempted, if not accomplished. Uh, where to go next? I think we're coming into the uh, final uh, few minutes of this session of this webinar, so I want to really not end before I hear some of your last thoughts on this. What next? What's coming? Um, what direction should we be looking in? Who should we be listening to? I have to think like a quick addition because it addresses both Charles Musser's comment and Peter's, and it's a little bit about methodology too as filmmakers and as scholars, which is um, how, how do we incorporate the, the voices of international students? Chinese international students in particular, and who, who are so central to Down Dark Stairwell. Um, and I'm curious how ADOC has, has um, whether they're inclusive of, of this category or not. Um, I mean, I think the, the uh, folks in this community are have tensions with this idea of Asian American altogether. But this, I think, methodologically, it speaks to the importance of um, multi, like have, have, having multilingual crew and filmmakers and scholars who are able to um, to investigate not just the media that we're used to, but like WeChat and Kakao and Line, areas where different kind of conversations are proliferating. And I think that's, um, and I, I also say this as a film festival programmer, you, can, you all have no idea how many films we are getting now that are by Chinese um, Ch Chinese international students under, under the banner of Asian American cinema. And a lot of these films don't end up being accepted into these film festivals because they have an uncomfortable relationship with Asian America. But this, this, is, this is a, this is coming and this needs to be addressed too. Um, I would just say with ADOC, I mean, there are a lot of Chinese international students in within ADOC. I mean, there's a lot of emerging filmmakers joining all the time. Like there's, it's, we're almost a thousand people in this network now. Not everybody is coming in, but, or active, but um, it is a question that, you know, we have talked about in terms of when we're, we were doing some strategic planning for ADOC and, and thinking about like, what is this porous definition of Asian American entail? And, you know, like someone like Leo Chang, who is an immigrant and also multilingual, lives in Taiwan part time, right? Like these are questions that I think are really important. And we're, it's constant, it's constantly evolving. And I don't think that we can say, like, this is, this is what Asian American is. And I, I think this question has always been around in terms of, like, even when I made films that there's nothing content wise uh, that related to an Asian American, they were in an Asian American film festival because I'm Asian American. So I think there's just many different ways to like tackle this question. Um, I wanted to say something too uh, about the, what uh, Abe's question. Um, it is interesting. I, I agree with Bao, you know, like I've been around filming around a lot of community organizers. And when we were doing a lot of filming in Georgia, you know, Ense Ufad, who's head of the New Georgia Project, she would always talk about their own organizing and how she says, like, culture eats strategy for lunch, right? And like, how do they, um, you know, appeal to audiences that are not interested necessarily in like electoral politics, but they care about video games or they care about whatever, you know, music and how do you uh, uh, think about audiences in that way? And, and that's something that I've, I'm still, contemplating right now in terms of next projects and, and next steps and how to, you know, have an impact in terms of this kind of work. I love that. I love that. I, I, I always thank people when they allow culture to come into the room with politics. And I always say, you never include us. You don't, you don't know what we're going to say. We don't have any metrics, but you can't get anything done without us. And my byline always is nobody has to elect a film. So the, looking at, you know, the adaptability and practicality that Renee was announcing, I think is, it comes to the fore that, that, we, that we're all sneaky and we can sneak in and get ahead of, of the obstacles um, and change people's minds. I still believe that. Ridiculed as it may be, I still believe that. Any last thoughts from the rest of you that we haven't heard from in this last portion? I guess I would say... Um to Brian's question that I agree with Grace that um, it, I'm reminded of the kind of panic that like Asian American literary studies went through in the 90s during the kind of like globalization of, you know, the transnationalization of Asian American studies and the, you know, the concern about it moving away from, you know, Asians based in the US and particularly those who had been, you know, in California or New York for multiple generations and 
um, you know, then it kind of shifted to, you know, like children of immigrants and, and all of that. And so I guess I want to be, I want to be open to seeing where that term takes us. If it, if, you know, if it comes to mean, um, you know, international students, I think, I don't know, I'm here for it. Great. And I want to just call out that in the chat, um, several people, uh, Patty Zimmerman, Daniel Maeda, and others have been talking in the hair about the May 19th videos and what an incredible project this is. And um, I know we haven't had time to go into it, but perhaps somebody will be writing about it for, from quarterly and we can catch up. Um, other last thoughts uh, before we, we close the room? Anything else? All right. Thank you all so much for taking time out in the summer, um, taking time out from your break if you're academics, taking time out from your other projects for the filmmakers. And um, to answer, uh, yes, this recording is absolutely going to be available. Uh, give us a few days to get it up. But if you go to filmquarterly.org slash category slash video, you will find this and our prior two panels on uh, Asian American media at 50, one of which has Melissa as a participant. The other has Rhea Tijeri and some others as participants, uh, really going deep into some of these same questions that have come up today. And uh, thank you, uh, Rebecca has just posted into the chat. Um, and uh, it will be there as, as we can't predict forever anymore, but uh, for as long as there's um, an accessible mm -hmm. website of this type, um, it'll be there. Thank you, everybody. Really, stay well. Bye-bye.